Hey everybody, Carson the Parts Guy here, and welcome to my step-by-step -step guide on how to DSG to manual swap an 8P Audi A3 2.0T Quattro. This video contains, first a disclaimer, uh, a little bit about me, uh, why you would swap out a DSG for a manual gearbox, the parts required for the DSG to manual swap, optional but recommended parts, required special or non-standard tools, a step-by-step -step swap process, the wiring connection guide, list of control modules requiring recoding and adaptation, and a special thanks to those who made this swap possible. This video documents the DSG to manual transmission swap of my personal 2011 Audi A3 2.0T Quattro. While I have attempted to explain everything thoroughly, you should not attempt this swap on your own unless you have sufficient technical knowledge to do so. Please refer to the workshop manual for any specifications not listed. I conducted this transmission swap at my own risk. If you choose to duplicate it, you also do so at your own risk. I'm a 20-year professional in automotive fixed operations. I'm formerly a certified Volkswagen and Audi technician a former certified Audi parts consultant, former certified VW service consultant, and a current Audi Club North America driving instructor. You can find me on Facebook at Carson the Parts Guy or Instagram at Carson the Parts Guy. If you find this video informative and helpful, please like and subscribe. Why would you swap out a DSG gearbox for a manual? Isn't the DSG gearbox faster? It, yes, it technically is. It shifts faster than any human ever could. But some people do prefer doing their own shifting and I'm one of those people. Uh, but the DSG is a better gearbox, right? And I would ask you for your definition of better. This car doesn't have the DQ500 version that came in the TTRS and RS3, which is a much better DSG gearbox. The DQ250 is known to have issues with the mechatronic unit as well as oil cooler failures that can cause catastrophic gearbox failure requiring replacement. The MQ350 manual gearbox doesn't have any coolant interaction, and you, of course, are the control unit. It's a manual gearbox. The parts required for this DSG to manual swap are as follows. You need a manual all-wheel drive O2Q or MQ350 gearbox, and this swap uses a brand new NFQ code Eurospec gearbox with taller 5th and 6th overdrive gears. The starter from any factory O2Q manual equipped Volkswagen or Audi with, depending on your engine, obviously we're using a four cylinder engine in this car, you will want a four cylinder O2Q starter. Any of them will work. Uh, bell housing bolts for factory O2Q gearbox. Uh, you can get it from a front wheel drive, it does not matter. And you'll need the starter bolts because those are part of the bell housing on a manual gearbox. The shifter box and cables from any PQ35 or PQ36 six-speed O2Q donor vehicle, which means you can use Mark V Volkswagen Golf uh, GTI or Jetta GLI. Uh, you can use Mark VI Golf, or GT, uh, Golf GTI or Jetta GLI. Uh, you can use an 8J 3.2 shifter box or you can also use an 8P uh, six-speed manual front wheel drive shifter box and cables. You'll also want the selector and relay levers on the gearbox matched to the shifter box and cables so that it all works together. It'll all bolt to any other OTQ gearbox, no problem. The clutch pressure plate and flywheel for an OTQ gearbox match to your engine. Uh, in this case, we're using an eight bolt flywheel for the TSI engine. Uh, you want the metal, metal scatter shield plate that goes between the engine and transmission from an O2Q donor vehicle. Uh, I used the one for my old FSI car and just modified it to fit. I had to cut one little uh, threaded insert out of it so that it sat properly against the engine for installation. Uh, you'll want the gas clutch and brake pedals from a manual PQ35 or PQ36 donor vehicle. Uh, you can also modify your factory gas pedal to work by removing the kick down detent. The shifter surround trim plate from a manual transmission model. Uh, in my case, I got one from Lifetime Audi Parts from a front track uh, Audi A3. 
new subframe bolts. Uh, they are one-time use, or they're supposed to be anyway. Uh, new axle bolts, also supposed to be one-time use. New flywheel bolts, again, one-time use. You'll need a reverse light switch with electrical connector and wires, either brand new from Volkswagen or Audi or from a donor vehicle. You'll want a clutch position switch electrical connector, which goes on the clutch pedal, and that's either new or from your donor vehicle. A DOT4 brake fluid so you can bleed the system. Uh, pin terminals for the ECU connector and J519, plus electrical wire. Uh, your choice to solder it together or use heat shrink butt connectors. Uh, the donor vehicle, once again, is really handy here. You can get all the connectors you need from that wiring harness. 5 8 inch heater hose junction from your friendly local auto parts store, and that is to delete the DSG cooler from the circuit. Uh, you can trim the hoses at your leisure. Optional but recommended parts. You'll want to do a new rear main seal. It's a waste if you have to go back in there and do it again after you waste, you know, put all this time into doing the swap. So I utilized 034 Motorsports billet rear main seal along with Permatex, right stuff, black silicone. Um, you'll want to probably do an aftermarket performance clutch, pressure plate, and flywheel setup. Uh, this swap uses a spec stage 2 plus clutch and pressure plate along with their light and single mass flywheel. You can also use a dual mass flywheel. I would recommend using a SAX upgraded clutch and pressure plate to deal with any additional output from chipping or bigger turbos. Use a new, new slave cylinder. I ran into a problem with this swap where it was delayed for a week because I left the brand new slave cylinder that came with the gearbox in it and it failed right off the bat. And kudos to my friend Matt for pulling the gearbox back out of the car until I could get back down there to finish this up. Uh, if you can get an all-metal version of that slave cylinder, all the better. An aftermarket bleeder block without the restrictor or remove the restrictor from the factory clutch bleeder block when using an aftermarket performance clutch pressure plate and flywheel. This improves response. Uh, you can also couple that with uh, the grabby gear kit that I have listed further down the, uh, the list here, which includes the bladed, braided stainless clutch line. Um, the 034 Motorsports subframe collar kit. You can also use um, Tyrol Sport. There's a few kits out there. I went with 034 because it is stainless. It comes with new subframe bolts and it solves the notorious clunk issue along with a handling improvement. Uh, I used a slave cylinder spacer from Nothing Lee's stock and that's recommended when using a single mass flywheel setup. A fluid damper crank pulley to eliminate clutch chatter from single mass flywheel. I did not use that on my swap. I plan to add that later. And of course, while you're under there, you may want to go ahead and service the Haldex unit. Required special or non-standard tools. So you will need something to get the car up off the ground. Uh, my buddy Matt, who facilitated this swap, has a quick jack system, which we used in this video. Uh, you can also use a lift uh, or jack stands and a jack. You need to get at least two feet off the ground with full access to the underside of the car so you can get everything out properly. You'll need a T10006A brake pedal release tool so you can change the brake pedal out. A 24 millimeter 12 point impact socket to remove the 12 point axle bolts. An engine support crossbar to support the engine while the transmission is unbolted and out of the vehicle. Uh, hydraulic table or transmission jack to remove the transmission. The table is the easiest thing. Triple square bit set, socket set so you can remove axle bolts and various other things. Uh, Torx bits, uh, T25 and T30 are what you're going to see. Uh, brake system pressure bleeder so you can bleed the clutch line. And you'll also need some form of factory scan tool. I have a VCDS. Uh, you can also use uh, OBD-11 or a equivalent for recoding the control modules. Step one is to remove the wheel center caps, which brings about step two of loosening your front axle hub bolts. 
do this on the ground. You do not want the car up in the air unless you have a really powerful impact gun. Uh, we're not using impact tools here. So in this case, got the old breaker bar. Break it loose on the ground, get it loose. And then you can pr proceed to the next step. Which is lifting the vehicle off the ground with the quick jack in action here. And this is super handy. Lift it all the way up, locks everything in place, and it's very steady. I feel much safer under this than I do working with jack stands, and it just makes the job a lot easier. But, of course, if you don't have one of these, you can also use a jack and jack stands. Just make sure to lift the vehicle safely, and be careful with what you're doing. We don't want any accidents to happen. And when using the quick jack, you want to make sure you lock it in place and hold that button for at least five seconds so you depressurize the lines. Then you want to move the driver's seat rearward fully. In my case, I've already swapped in a manual driver's seat from a Jetta GLI. If you still have factory power seats, you definitely want to move that rear fully before you disconnect the battery, otherwise it's going to be a major pain in the ass for you. Next step is to disconnect battery cables and remove the air box. In my case, I have a custom made from an old, from a TFSI new speed cold air intake. Uh, it was real easy for me to take mine out. Next thing you want to do is remove the battery tray and battery. Obviously, battery first. Needs to be completely out of the way. As your clutch pedal is right behind it, where you'll need access to anyway. And you also need to remove it to get the gearbox out. Next thing you want to do is disconnect the electric steering rack wiring harness. So, in this case, you're going to want to disconnect it here. It should be the second wire in on your engine compartment fuse panel on the wiring block here. Next is you have an electrical connector down here that needs to come be disconnected. And then you have your ground connection here, uh, right at the base of the wiring conduit, and you need to remove that. Then once you've freed up the steering rack harness, uh, I put mine up on the cowling and freed it up so that when you remove the subframe assembly, it just comes right down. Uh, you'll need to use a trim removal tool inside the conduit to free the harness up uh, with these uh, connectors right here. Those just clip in there. Uh, trim removal tool makes short work of them. Then you'll want to remove the U-joint cover. Then remove the U-joint retaining bolt and disconnect the U-joint from the steering rack input. It's a 13 millimeter, by the way. And once you're done with that, you can use a pry bar to help separate the U-joint uh, from the steering rack input shaft. Then you're going to want to pull the front wheels off. That's done. 
Then remove the lower front fender liner on the driver's side and the lower engine cover. Your T25 bits are going to come in handy on this one. Oh, oh man. Finish that up. You'll want to use a trim removal tool for removing the plastic rivet that holds the back of it in. And then you're going to want to remove the steering rack and subframe assembly. You can use a floor jack. It helps to have a second person in here. I've got Matt on the other side helping me out here. Uh, you've got six bolts that hold in the subframe. And they are 18 millimeter. You've got two 13 millimeter bolts holding in the exhost bracket. Uh, 16 millimeter nuts, three on each side holding the lower ball joint. Well, on the control arm to the steering knuckle. And you can just uh, remove the ball joint, leave it hanging off of the knuckle. That's the easiest way to get it done. Um, everything goes planned. It's okay. I mean, you can drop that. There you go. Not too much. Stop, stop, stop. Walk a little bit to level it out. There you go. Just gonna extract it. There you go. Now, I don't know. Go back. Come back. Back up. Come more straight. So you gotta extract the water. Come back a little bit. Now come straight. There you go. There you go. And there it is. That helps make this swap a lot easier. So following that, obviously you want to remove the driver's side CV axle. I think that's it. As Pull that out. Is except for the mounts and the, and the coolant line. Then you remove the passenger side axle. And here's where we're at so far. We've got the subframe out. Both axles are out. You have access to the side of the transmission by removing that lower shield. And obviously you needed to remove the lower engine cover, so you have access to remove the subframe and underneath the motor. Now is a really good time, if you have a dirty subframe and a pressure washer, to clean it up. So these coolant lines are no longer necessary. So we're going to clamp the lines off using a hose clamp tool and install the 5 8 junction pipe and secure the hoses out of the way using a wire tie. Uh, you can also at this time if you wish to trim those hoses down and get them out of the way that way uh, or alternatively you can use a manual transmission cool line setup if you want to buy new hoses. This is the easiest way so that's what we did. At this point you'll want to remove the starter and disconnect the DSG shifter cable. And following that, unbolt the DSG gearbox from the engine and remove it from the vehicle. In this case, you see the hydraulic table pictured. It was real easy to come in from the side and jack it up. And it didn't even contact the bumper. You, do, you don't need to go up that high. Literally just get it on underneath and you can come right out the side after you twist and turn the gearbox underneath it to clear the steering knuckle and it comes right out. Then you'll want to remove the DSG flywheel and the shield plate because you need to use the manual transmission shield plate. The DSG one will not work. <sighs> now here's step 20. 
the optional replacement of the rear main seal, I would strongly suggest you replace it. In which case you can see on the left is the original stamped steel uh, rear main seal with the PTFE uh, seal in it. These are failure prone and the billet rear main seal from 034 Motorsport on the right has a spring loaded seal and is much less prone to failure. Highly recommend it. Then you're going to want to install the manual transmission shield plate and the flywheel. I forgot to install my shield plate and I had to cut it and flip it up there so don't do what I did. Make sure you install it first then put the flywheel in. Step 22 is to install the clutch disc using the installation tool onto the flywheel. And there you see the spec stage 2 plus clutch in all its glory. It's rated for 456 pound-feet of torque. Then install your pressure plate over the clutch disc and remove the installation tool. Disconnect your exhaust system. Uh, you can just remove the downpipe but in my case the exhaust clamp was stuck on there so I just pulled the whole thing out and you'll never have better access to the downpipe than with the transmission out of the car. Use that opportunity. Then you'll want to remove the front exhaust heat shield uh, you'll have to unbolt the front of the drive shaft and you'll also have to remove some little uh, sheet metal spring clips that hold it in. A trim removal tool works very well for this. Then pull your DSG shifter out. It's held in by four 10 millimeter nuts and uh, there you see me holding my catch of the day on the left and you see a hole in the floor on the right and that's what it looks like when you're looking at it with no shifter in the car. You'll see the wiring harness connector up here. You'll need to just tuck that out of the way. It's no longer used. Then you install your manual transmission shifter. Obviously reverse of the removal of the DSD shifter and you can install your new shifter uh, plate, your trim plate that goes around it, but do not put the boot into the shifter plate yet because you'll need to adjust the shifter and the transmission linkage later. So you'll have to install your manual accelerator pedal or modify your existing pedal next. On the left you see a picture of the manual accelerator pedal that does not have the kick down detent and on the right you see the automatic or DSG accelerator pedal that has the kick down detent. You can remove this and it basically turns it into a manual transmission accelerator pedal. So if you don't want to buy one or you can't get one, you can do it that way. Then you have to remove the DSG brake pedal using the T10006A release tool. Right here on the picture you see is the little nylon clip that holds the rod coming out of the brake booster in. The release tool goes in there and presses on these two tabs here that hold the ball in. There are other ways of doing it. I've heard of people that have not used the factory tool, but I highly recommend getting the factory tool. Matt had it. It made it easy for us. It's definitely worth it. Would not do this job without it. Then you install your manual transmission brake pedal. It's held in by a 13 millimeter head bolt and nut. Uh, just use a gear wrench and a regular combination wrench to remove it, put it in there, and get it located onto the brake booster shaft and press it on there so that it clicks and locks into place. Then you install your clutch pedal you're going to have, you see in the picture, this piece of foam insulation is held in place by three little metal uh, clips like you'll find on the heat shield underneath the car. Uh, you can either spin those off with a pick or remove them with a trim tool, whichever you can get in there. And uh, it's held in by some 13 millimeter head 
uh, nuts, which you'll want to get from your donor vehicle, or just match up some hardware and get it in there. It's not really mission critical, grade 8 stuff, so nothing to worry about there. Then you go ahead and reinstall your heat shield and your downpipe and exhaust system. Obviously, installation is the reverse of removal. Then you're going to want to go ahead and prepare and install your manual transmission. So at this point, install your clutch slave. If you have the spacer from Nothing Leaf Stock, go ahead and put that on. You can use gasket tack to help hold it on there, uh, make it easier for you. And if you have to install your shifter, go ahead and install that. Uh, if you can get new bushings, go ahead and put those on. And you want to go ahead and bolt that all together. And once you install the main transmission, secure the shift linkage to the back right here. And that also has the USP Motorsports grab -a gear bushings to help solidify that bracket on the back of the transmission that holds the cables. At this point you want to adjust your shifter linkage. If I go back to this slide and show you, there is this pin on the side of your shift tower. If you depress this into the gearbox, you should be able to push this pin in and lock it in place. Then you unload the spring tension on the cable ends. And once you have, you lock this into place first with the cable ends unlocked and with the tower locked into place, release these cable ends, release the tension on them, and then you can remove your pin from the shifter. At this point, you want to go ahead and connect the hydraulics and bleed the system. Do this now and make sure you don't have a mission critical failure with the slave cylinder. Make sure you don't have any leaks because if you have to pull the gearbox out now, you still haven't installed the subframe. Once that's good to go, go ahead and put in your manual transmission starter. And at this point, you want to go ahead and do your wiring connections. Pictured here is the connector for J519 underneath the dash. You'll need to remove the knee bar trim on the driver's side to access this. And that in my case, it was the black connector on J519, which is underneath all of the electricals. It's right on the bottom. Can't miss it. So here are six wiring connections that you need to make. Uh, if you do not have a 2011 8P A3 2.0T Quattro, please refer to the wiring diagram for your vehicle and confirm. You can use this guide on any PQ35 or PQ36 chassis to, for the mechanicals to swap it from DSG to manual. Uh, but in this case, uh, reverse light switch, you pin one is going to be a fused 15 amp input supply voltage connection. I used an inline fuse from the supply strip at the engine compartment fuse box and an unused access point there and a ring terminal to connect it plus a little nut to hold it on. Uh, pin two, you're going to run out of the reverse light switch to terminal 52A16, which is the black connector, pre black connector previously pictured at J519 under the dash, and uh, this terminal will need to be added as it's missing from the harness, so you, you won't have anything to tap into there. You need to add the connector, and I just pulled my connector out of my spare wiring harness. So the clutch position sensor, G476, that is on the clutch pedal, and the connector is located on the engine compartment side. So pin one will go to chassis ground. You can ground it anywhere in the engine compartment that has, uh, you can tap into an existing ground. Uh, pin two is a white and red wire and that goes to terminal uh, T9443 uh, at the engine control module. And that is the big ECM connector. And it will have a plastic dummy pin inserted. Once you can uh, take the connector apart, it makes it easy to spot. And that's where you install your new pin and route the 
wire as an overlay or route it through your harness, depending on how much time you want to use. I just ran it as an overlay and taped it up. Uh, pin 3 is unused. Uh, pin 4 was uh, the lilac and black wire uh, from terminal 52C30 at J519. Uh, you can run the wire there if you'd like, or if you want to make things easy, you can just splice at the Mechatronic TCM connector, and that wire is so you can start the car with the clutch interlock. You can also just straight up ground that wire out, but you will not have clutch interlock, and you can engage the starter any time. You can do it. I don't recommend it. Pin 5 is input voltage, 30 amps from pin 4 of the brake light switch inside the engine compartment at the brake master cylinder on all PQ36 facelift 8PA3s. Uh, some of the older cars have the brake light switch inside the car on the pedal. This actually has it on the master and it makes it super easy. So at this point you'll want to go ahead and reinstall your CV axles and loosely install the hub bolt for each axle. Do not tighten it right now. You want to tighten that on the ground. You can hand tighten it. Don't fully torque it. And now you want to go ahead and reinstall your subframe and steering rack assembly, optionally installing the subframe collar kit. Um, when you reinstall the subframe, I recommend loosening the two bolts on each control arm bushing to make it easier to line the bolt holes up. It made my life so much easier. Then route the harness back through the guides and reattach each connection for the steering rack. And following that, reinstall your remaining components, your front lower engine cover and the front uh, lower front wheelhouse lining. Uh, both front wheels, hand tight. Uh, your battery tray, battery, and air box. Uh, lower the vehicle down to the ground. Then torque your wheels and axle bolts. The axle bolts are torqued to yield. See the workshop manual. I believe it's 150 foot-pounds, or 148 foot-pounds, plus 180 degree turn if you can do it. It's very tough. Now step 42 is to recode and adapt your control modules. So you want to boot up your VCDS or whatever software you're using. And first is to recode the engine control module. And uh, with the VCDS, it's really easy. Just use the long coding helper and recode it to a manual six-speed gearbox. Uh, that gives you multiple options, but that's the one you want, obviously. So moving on, go to address word 17, which is the instrument cluster, and you'll code to manual gearbox by adding to the sum of the first four digits of coding using the value supplied by VCDS. I believe it's four. And you can leave the rest of the coding intact, and all it will do is put your message up on the cluster to depress the clutch pedal before starting vehicle. Address word 19 is the gateway, and you'll want to just go to your installation list and remove automatic transmission from the list so it's no longer looking for a control module that is no longer present. And finally, with address word 22, which is the Haldex control module, uh, you'll want to go in there. It's going to keep retaining a code for transmission control module, uh, no signal. Uh, you'll get rid of that by running basic settings at the following values, which are 97, 50, 41, 40, and 20. Clear the fault codes and recheck. You should have no more faults, and it's good to go. No recoding necessary on the all-wheel drive unit. And your final result. And there you have it. It runs, it drives, and all those warning lights will shut off as you turn the wheel a couple of times as I back the car out of the garage here. Uh, those are all ESP faults that go away once you've adapted the uh, steering angle sensor. You see the lights shut off, TPMS is dependent on that system, and that's why it's throwing a TPMS light. And at that point, it's ready to rock. So, before, we had this uh, 
cruising speed at 83 miles an hour, roughly about 3,200 RPM. And that was a little too high for me. Now with the NFQ gearbox installed, 2,600 RPM at 80 miles an hour. Nice and quiet. And probably get some fuel economy out of it too. And that's it. It's all done. And I'd like to thank my friend Matt Guerra. Without his help and the use of his shop and the equipment, the project would have been much more difficult. He's a major league Audi enthusiast and he's one of my best friends. And Matt's dad, Paul, uh, he provides precision machining services without a trip to the machine shop when we need them. Uh, made his own milling machine out of a drill press and he's very accurate with it, I assure you. Uh, my brother Andrew is a uh, current Audi parts consultant and uh, he supplied a few of the parts I needed for this swap and parts catalog help when I need it. Uh, my parents for supporting me and my hobby since time immemorial and working on cars with my dad is how I got into this. Uh, my wife and son for their support and my long weekends away from home getting this done. Audi Club North America Definitely one of the better parts of uh, my Audi enthusiast experience. I definitely recommend joining. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And leave any questions you may have in the comments. I'll do my best to like or reply. Thank you for watching.